fantastic yeah. to see so many of you out here tonight. This is one of our biggest crowds post-COVID. So thank you for being here in person and thank you to all of those online as well. We greatly appreciate your engagement in mm -hmm. our lecture series. Real quick pieces of housekeeping, of course, if you do need to use the toilets, they are up the very back of the space. Likewise, if you have any issues at any time, please find myself up the back, as well as Arachne or Lilia to help you out. So tonight we will be doing a few quick things, uh, as well as the lecture itself and the presentation of the medal and certificate. We also have a very brief uh, introduction for you about the life and times of James Park Thompson himself. Researched by our excellent collections committee. And for those of you in here tonight, you will see our brand new display up the back here behind me of some of the artifacts and a bit of detail about J.P. Thompson. And this is a, the first in what I hope will be a long line of uh, displays and exhibits available to all the members right here at Gregory Place using the numerous resources we have in our various collections. So please, if you do get the time to come in, have a look. Uh, we'll um, hopefully take some pictures and just get them out online as well for those that can't see it in person. Apart from that, everyone, thank, thank you so much for coming and we will get rolling now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you John. John. Um, Before we start tonight's talk by Professor Rimmer, I'll say a few words about the man this occasion is named for, James Park. Thompson, who was the founder of this geographical society in 1885. Here we see a few portraits of the man at various stages of his life. Now, I think, is that showing up on the Zoom? Oh, great. Uh, thanks, Adi. Um, now, now, one of these. Try that one. Ah. We have um, had blown up and printed, and it's on the pillar over to my right, facing our portrait of A.C. Gregory, who was our first president. So my pleasure tonight is to launch the Society's new display cases, which fittingly focus on J.P. Um, Gregory, or J.P. Thompson, sorry. Um, yeah, and an outline of his life and achievements. So, um, as mentioned by John uh, earlier on. So, there's also information about him in the program, which is given on your chair, um, and further information in the display. Now, I don't intend to go over Thompson's life and achievements. They're covered in the program and display, but I'm going to deliver a couple of anecdotes. Um, one about Birkin Wills Camp 119 near the Gulf of Carpentaria, and the secondly, the Bonaparte Tasman map. So let's see how this works. Okay. First anecdote. Those of us familiar with the Birkin Wills story will know that they crossed Australia from south to north, aiming to reach the Gulf of Carpentaria. Now, they made their last major camp, number 119, a few miles short of the Gulf. After travelling some miles further, they were turned back by mud, mangroves and mosquitoes. And not reaching the Gulf, but persuaded by the rise and fall of the salty water, but they were very close. That was good enough, they felt. So after blazing a few trees, um, they moved south, they headed south again. The SARP research party passed through a few months later. There is no record of any European visiting the site till the 1900s when a local pastoralist reported observing the blazed trees. Um, the society decided to send J.P. Thompson to visit the site. So, uh, yep. it's one of the blazed trees. 
Thompson found the blaze trees with the letter B, thereby confirming that the site was Birkin Wills Camp 119, and thus answering a question which had been first asked back in Birkin Wills time, did they reach the Flinders River or the Albert River? Now, just to explain that question, um, you see here Camp 119, which is actually on the Bino River, but the Bino is an anna, anna branch of the Flinders. The Albert River is 150 kilometres to the west, where Burktown is nowadays. So basically, the um, Burkenwills believe that they got to the Albert River but um, it really, they have got to the Flinders or Bino River. So uh, Thompson resolved that. And just to go off on a bit of a tangent, um, RGSQ has re retained links to the site by putting a plaque there in 1986 and revisiting in 2009. Now, the second little anecdote is about the Bonaparte Tasman map in the Mitchell Library. How many of you have seen it? How many of you have been to the Mitchell Library? Then you have seen it. You have walked over it. Um, in 1905, Thompson did a round the world trip, a bit of an effort in those days, and he met with Prince Roland. Bonaparte in Paris. Now, Prince Roland was related to Napoleon and he was greatly interested in geography and he was a later a president of the French Geographical Society. And he had a library of 200,000 items. Makes ours look rather small. And he, uh, he showed Thompson a map this, uh, which had been drawn by the Dutch in about 1640. A map of about two thirds of Australia's coastline. Long before anybody had thought of James Cook's grandfather, I would say. Anyhow, Thompson wrote this up in his book, Round the World. You know, he, as you do when you do a round the world trip, you write a book about it. And uh, there's a few paragraphs devoted to this meeting with Prince Roland. And uh, 20 years later, a lady called Daisy Bates, which I imagine you, many of you have heard of, she was in the Nullarbor Plain doing research. And she read this book. And she noted this reference to the Tasman map. So she said, oh, that, we'd be interested in getting that here. So she wrote it to Mitchell Library and said, are you interested? And the Mitchell Library was very interested. And it took seven years, but eventually got, they got the map to Australia. They had to do it in secret because they, uh, they didn't want the Commonwealth government to be <laughs> Uh, competing for it. And a few years later, uh, about 1940, the, um, the, uh, the Mitchell Library had the map reproduced on the floor of their foyer in very hard marble. And you see it there. So I suppose in briefly, this Thompson played a critical part in the, uh, this serendipitous chain of events that brought this map into Australia and possibly really recasts how we think about Australia's history. So that's a second little story. So turning to the display, I will say that uh, it has several publications by Thompson, notes about his life and activities, 
a copy of the society minutes of his signature as president in the 1890s, as well as a glass projector, like the one he may have used when delivering commercial geography lectures at the Brisbane Technical College in 1894. Commercial geography, interesting term. The display was put together by Peter Lloyd with assistance from Neville McMillan, both long-standing members of the society. And the cabinets were acquired with funds from the Commonwealth Community Heritage Grants. So at this juncture, it's my pleasure to officially open or launch the display on J.B. Thompson in these two cabinets, newly acquired by the society. Now I urge everyone to peruse the display and enjoy learning about the society's founder. Over to you, David. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll uh, start off by paying our respects to the uh, Jagger and Turtle people, uh, the original uh, owners of this land. And uh, tonight uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, the Honours Committee uh, in one of our most important activities of the year, which is to award honours to deserving parties. And uh, this evening, uh, Professor Peter Rimmer from ANU is going to be uh, that recipient. Now, first of all, I've got to uh, make a small admission, uh, and that is that uh, in the Honours Committee, which consisted of John Holmes, who's here this evening, and Les Iastel, and also Duncan Cook, uh, I had to abstain from voting uh, in support of Peter. And you might ask, how could that possibly be? Well, if I were going to tell you anything much more about Peter, I must also tell you about my abstention, because Peter was my PhD supervisor at uh, ANU uh, many more years ago, Peter, than we might care to remember. And uh, I was a young man at the time, uh, so was Peter, and uh, Peter uh, proceeded uh, around about 1972, fairly early in the piece, to um, set me uh, afoot uh, in the world of computing with CSIRO in Canberra, in uh, grouping and computational routines. That was immensely beneficial because I don't think I would have actually got my PhD finished uh, without that uh, intervention. But back in those days, uh, we all had a wonderful time roaming around the Coombs building, HC Coombs building. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that particular building, but uh, it was uh, of such proportion uh, that there had to be a large 40 or 50 page document put together by our colleague Godfrey Lynch, which was called simply Navigation in the Coombs Building. And the Coombs Building was a series of hexagons, but unfortunately, the levels weren't the same. And we were quite accustomed at that stage to showing off our geographical knowledge by telling people which hexagon of the Coombs they were in and also which level. It was sort of like something out of Dante, uh, the levels uh, of uh, the descent into chaos and the rest of it. But nonetheless, uh, that, was, uh, that was the scene. Well, Peter informed me that he was a, a transportation geographer, and I think that we could say he's pretty reliably stuck to that uh, prescription uh, throughout uh, his long and uh, illustrious career. And at that time, there weren't too many people in Australia who would have rated themselves as transportation geographers. I'm thinking perhaps uh, Peter or Peter Gilmore at Monash University, whom you might have known when you were there, who was mainly into um, product distribution and logistics. And uh, I don't know whether you soaked up a bit of the vibe uh, from Peter Gilmore, but uh, Peter's uh, subsequent career has um, taken on a fair amount of uh, activity in supply chains and logistics. And supply chains, of course, is something that couldn't be more relevant right at the moment, um, as we're told that they're contributing to uh, inflation and um, uh, lack of uh, products on supermarket and other shelves, and also influencing progress in the building and construction industry. 
So the uh, address tonight, uh, which I'll briefly uh, summarise, a la the abstract uh, for those who haven't seen it, is about China's geologistics. And uh, Peter's written there at the front and centre in his oration, which is nice because we've had orations on physical geography and uh, uh, we've had other uh, uh, colleagues and students from ANU who have actually won the uh, Thompson Award, one being Jim Wormsley a number of years ago, and Bob Fagan, so it continues some sort of a tradition. So logistics has been honed as a policy tool within China before being transformed into a geologistic strategy known as the Belt and Road Initiative. Reflecting different logistics geographies between China's interior and coastal regions, this initiative distinguishes between land-based planning in Eurasia and a maritime stratagem for the world's oceanic realm. But Peter says his task is to unpack these arenas by identifying and examining the Silk Road Economics Belt three land bridges and three secondary economic corridors, and the 21st century maritime roads four blue economic passages to reveal the initiative's geographical scope, significance, and emerging impact, which I think is something we'll all be interested to hear. Likely logistics developments within China are then considered before looking ahead to the country's economic position in 2050 and examining an integrating project that falls beyond the initiative underlying uh, transcontinental uh, reverse and classical models. So of all the people in Australian geography, uh, academic geography, I would say that Peter's shown the keenest interest in uh, Asia, uh, but particularly Northeast Asia. And I don't think there's anybody uh, better qualified to uh, speak on this matter of Chinese logistics and initiatives than Peter. However, before Peter uh, speaks, we've got the pleasant task of um, awarding him the uh, Thompson Certificate and Medal. And I don't know, Peter, if you've seen uh, the list of Thompson awardees over the years, but you join a, an august uh, company of uh, uh, other uh, geographers and practitioners as well because this isn't simply an academic award. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, the other members of the Honours uh, Committee um, who've uh, endorsed this uh, recommendation. And I'd ask Peter to uh, come forward now so that I can present the medal and the award. Now, Peter, the first test for you this evening is whether you'd like to have the certificate or the medal first. <laughs> uh, I think I'd like both. <laughs> <laughs> sort of person who can't choose between rice bubbles and cornflakes. <laughs> okay, well, I think we'll give you this. We'll give you the medal first because right. you can put that in your pocket. Right. And you. then you can carry the certificate. Right. How does that sound? <laughs> so, I'm going to be careful here. Oh, so here's the medal. Yes, move this back here. So <laughs> good. <laughs> so Peter, congratulations on behalf of the society. This is one of the few awards that you haven't already achieved, uh, but um, we've saved the best for last, maybe. Good. I hope you still <laughs> hope you still get plenty of awards after this one, but this is probably the best that Queensland has to offer in the domain of geography. So that being the case, we now move on to the certificate. I'm not moving till the last photographer's book. <laughs> okay, as they say in options, you're all done. Yeah, Good. done. All right, okay then. Well, Peter, that's for you. Thank you. But you might like to put those things somewhere safe, such as here. And have you got slides to uh, yeah. put forward? Well, I think while Peter's getting himself fixed up, let's give him a round of applause anyway. <laughs> well, we're not used on this one, then. No. No. Okay. That's a good way. Oops. 
So the last time I had a photograph taken with um, David, I was wearing my Mao jacket. So <laughs> times have changed. <laughs> so this evening, I'd like to pay my respects first to the indigenous people of this site, and then move on to my oration. The focus of my oration is to look at, to talk to some of the maps that I've drawn in China. Um, and the function is to look at the, what China's called the belt and the road. So one belt, one road. And Xi Jinping in 2013 trying to legitimize this by using the camel to think of the silk that used to move along the Silk Road between 130 BCE until maybe the Ottomans sort of prevented it from moving in the 15th century. And the other motif is the ship of Admiral Ching He, who sailed across the Indian Ocean six or seven times. So what Xi Jinping was trying to do was to legitimize this emphasis on the Belt and Road. Now, my map here shows the original routes, the first one from Xi'an to Duisburg in the Eurasia, and also the one between Fuchau and, and Rotterdam, the um, shipping routes. But in 2015, there was a Moscow deviation. Why was that? Well, Mr. Putin wasn't very happy with the original route, and mm -hmm. it was changed to accommodate him. And this has had a big impact on the routes which were later chosen. So my paramount issue here is to assess how far China's reach, geographical reach, has extended beyond the initiative's 21st century Silk Road economic belt, and how far it's gone beyond the Maritime Sea Road. And my structure is to address this issue. And when I was doing this, I found out there was 1,583 papers in English on the Belt and Road. And since then, there's also another 15,930 in Chinese. So. What I'm trying to do is a lot of those were very looking at small bits of the Belt and Road. What I'm trying to do is to look at the lot, and that may be a challenge. So this is my structure. What I do first is look at the antecedents of the Belt and Road in China's internal geography. And then I move on from the Silk Road to look at three Eurasian land bridges, and not three, but four economic corridors now, and four blue economic passages. So I want you to think three, four, four. And then I'm gonna take you from looking at Eurasia through South and Southeast Asia and moving from Europe through Antarctica to the Arctic and the Trans-Pacific. And then I'll draw some conclusions by highlighting the importance of adopting a geographical approach. 
Now, I want to use two terms. One is logistics geographies, and the other one is geologistics. And I'll come back to them in my conclusion. But the Maritime Sea Road, its antecedents were in the development of these ports on the eastern seaboard. Originally, Mao Zedong had concentrated China's industrial development inland because he was frightened that the Americans would bomb them. So he moved those inland. But in the 1980s, when Deng Xiaoping took over, they started the development of the eastern seaboard, including one place called Shenzhen near Hong Kong, which we'll come back to later. And all of this was done by state-owned enterprises. Xi Jinping has, emphasizes that this is the way he wants development to occur. And once that developed in the 1980s, the eight out of 10 now of the top container ports in the world are in China. And I've listed them on my map. The second part was to get the inland area. So what he wanted it to do is to go west and develop the western part of China. So the emphasis was then on railways and dry ports and highways. Now, so what we've done so far is to go east, then we're going west. And in the 2000s, they said, let's go outside China. Let's go global. And that was the third move. And I describe going global, taking your logistics beyond China's borders as geologistics. Because the emphasis is to improve China's global connectivity. So let's look at the my structure in beginning with the Silk Road Economic Development and the three land bridges. This was a blueprint which the Chinese developed. And you can see there are three bridges, one beginning in Vladivostok, which was outside China. The second one was Lianyanggang, which is the central bridge. And the third one is the southern bridge. This one is the result of the Moscow deviation. You began in Lunyangang, Xi'an, Lanchao, Yurumqui, Moscow, Duisburg. The other one is the existing Trans-Siberian Railway. And this one, which they hope to develop, we can see how far that has progressed. But what this did to China was to transform it. For the first time, it became a continental economy. Before that, it wasn't. It became like the United States, which was a continental economy. This was the first time that China became a continental economy. And this is the, the biggest development in China, much bigger than some of the things happening at the moment in the South Pacific, which I'll we'll look at later. And what I've tried to do with this map is transpose those places onto um, the map of, of the Eurasia. So we have the Northern Bridge and we have the Central Bridge, and that's resulted in a lot of places in China becoming freight hubs, railway freight hubs. So this China-European freight trade is particularly important. I put one or two other places on this map. 
um, between Kurgas and Minsk, um, there's a Russian large gauge railway. So we have to change your containers from one gate to another in Kurgas and take them away in Minsk and move on before you can move on to Duisburg. The importance of this is that um, if you're in Chongqing, previously you would have to take your freight to Shanghai and then send it by sea to Rotterdam. And that took 31 to 32 days and it cost $3,000. Even though if you go by rail direct from Chongqing on this route to Duisburg, the cost now is 4,400. But as you've learned recently, the cost of shipping containers has gone up six or tenfold. So this is a big advantage to a place like Chongqing. And mentioning Chongqing again, this was the first time in 2011 that the local government started this movement of railing containers to Europe. And this was personally taken over by the central government. China containers took over it from the local government. But when I talk about state enterprise in China, I'm talking about not only the central government, but also provincial governments and even some of the urban governments have certain scope to develop. And the third thing I want to get out of this map is to say that the southern bridge to New Delhi, to Tehran, on its way to Duisburg, is still embryonic. It's not been developed. Now, one of the problems of China's development is its impact on India. This is a subtext of what I'm talking about. All the time, every move that China makes has an impact on India. And I'm not going to mention this again, but I'll put this slide in to remind me to say that every move China makes, uh, it impacts on India. And this map is to show you that um, China has to cut across the, uh, the, to Banda Asa, Asa by sea, and then go by road or rail to Riga. And that's very disjointed. Now, a place called Yiru, which is right in this area, which is 11,000 kilometers from Riga, can get there in a much, in 12 days, whereas going this route be from Mumbai to Riga, is 10 to 15 days. Now, China is, is at an advantage compared with India in this, even though India has an express corridor. But India is also concerned about China in four economic corridors. You can see them here. And we're going to look at these economic corridors in turn. This is the second model that China has. It's really developing inland centers like Kunming and Kashgar as geologistic cities, dry ports. But China is trying to get through for the places in Western China to give them access to the sea. And there's a reason for that. China wants to develop its economy beyond a manufacturing economy to a service economy. And it wants to develop parts of South and Southeast Asia to supply low value imports so that it can concentrate on exports of high tech products. 
So let's look at some of these corridors. The first one is the China Indochina Economic Corridor. What China wanted, wants to do is to go from Kunming to Singapore. And it's already started that process. It's going from Kunming to VNTM. High speed rail is already complete. It cost um, half the gross domestic product of Laos to get this railway built. But it does give opportunities to link Laos into the rest of Indochina, Indochina Peninsula. But you can see a lot of shortcomings. The, the Thai leg has not been built. Um, Mahatia wanted to change the route in um, Malaysia, so it ended at Fort Klang, not in Singapore. And this supposedly high speed train between Kuala Lumpur and Singapore has been put off now to the 2030s. So this project has not, not been finished. But, but Kunming, this is what China wants to promote. Link them to the sea and help transform the economy, not only of the recipient countries, but of China itself. Now, the other thing for China, what drives China's policy is the Malacca Straits. 80% of its energy has to go through the Malacca Straits. So, and that's a concern to China. So another thing they're trying to do is to find alternatives to the Malacca Straits because this is a choke point, and there was a famous um, thinker called Mann, Alfred Mann in the 1890s, who used to focus on choke points. And this has influenced the Chinese strategic thinkers. They're very bothered about the Malacca Strait. Let's move on to the next corridor. Still, we're looking at Kunming, and originally they were trying to link Kunming to Kolkata. But as I said before, one of the subjects of my talk is that India is not particularly keen for this to go across the chicken's neck in this part of India. As you notice up here, there's a lot of disputed borders between uh, India and China. So while that stalled, um, China got on to develop the Sway gas field to provide a gas pipeline to Kunming and on to Nanning. And also it was it has developed the port of Kyakyu which is used to import oil and from the Middle East and move it through to a pipeline through to Kunming. And this has been developed as an industrial zone, but it's been scaled back. Now, these changes, the development of the link between Kunming and Piakpu has led the Chinese to change this, the name of the corridor. They're keeping the original name, but they're now calling this the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor. And China was asked, why are you keeping the name of the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar one? Well, the answer, China wants to develop a railroad from China into Nepal. And that's the big emphasis now. Remember, there's been some confrontation between China and India in that area.
And the last of the economic corridors is the Pakistan one. Now, I've left a lot of my icons on the screen because that's to remind me that China has put in $60 billion to develop the Pakistani economy. It wants to move the Pakistani economy from agriculture to industry so it can supply parts to China. And three quarters of that money has gone into energy and the other has gone into uh, transport and telecommunication. But the key element of this, from what I'm interested in, is the link between Kashgar is the link between Kashgar and Radar. What the Pakistanis wanted was the, the road to come this way through Islamabad, Lahore, on the way to Karachi. The Chinese wanted to take this to a fishing port in Gwadar, which was under development by the port of Singapore. But the port of Singapore got squeezed out. And now this is a, a big development by China of the port of Gwadar. And these developments are disturbing Baluchistan and people of Baluchistan. And quite recently, the Chinese have been, three Chinese have been killed by the Baluchistani Liberation Front. And this area here is a bit like the Wild West and very difficult for China to do that. But already 5,000 Chinese are going to be based here, professional to develop this, this link between the Arabian Sea and Kashgar. And this is what China's trying to avoid is its dependence on the Malacca Strait. Now, we've already done three land bridges, four economic corridors, and now we come to floor blue economic passengers. There's the China, Indian Ocean, Africa, Mediterranean. There's the China, Arctic Ocean. There's the China, Oceania, South Pacific, and the China, Trans-Pacific Ocean. And I've cheated a little bit, because I've added Antarctica onto the Oceania and the South Pacific. This is Main Street. This is where all the ports on the Maritime Sea Road are concentrated. The United States has called these a string of pearls because they feel they threaten United States hegemony. But there's a little bit of spillover from this passage. There's one in here, sorry about that. One here. There's one here in Paranac, Paranagua in Brazil. And also, this is a list of Belt and Road ports. And when you look at that, who's included? Darwin, Melbourne, Newcastle. Now, the Ministry of Transport said there are 42 ports in China, in, this, in China's maritime sea road, but they never list them. And I found a source called the Grandview Institution in Chinese, which tells me 35 of the ports. And I've added another five, but I'm still too sure. So if you find those two, let me know. But I'm still working on that. <coughs> but you can see there's one place I should have mentioned before, that's China Merchants. It's got a 50% share now in the port of Newcastle.
And the other one I wanted to mention was Tandyong Priok. Because what China tries to do is build more than a port. It wants to build a city and an industrial park, the package. And it's targeting Chandyam Priok amongst those other ones because already there's a $6 million railway, 142 kilometers being built between uh, Jakarta and Bandung, adding this to the package. So this is the model of which China is pursuing through China merchants. It's got a, a port, it's got an industrial park, and it's got a city. The model came from Shenzhen. One of my students studied this in 1979. And the idea is to replicate this model around the world. And you can see in the purple dots, this is where China merchants <coughs> are distributed. It's city, park, port model. And the one I want to talk about, I can only talk about one or two of these here, but is Port Djibouti, which was built by the Chinese State Engineering Corporation and financed by a loan from the China Exim Bank. Um, again, China squeezed out a company called DP World, which had been given the job of putting by the Djibouti government into building a port. But this is very strategic. Already, um, the United States has a port in this area. But, and the other port of interest is, is in Sri Lanka. There's a family called uh, Rajapaksas. There's uh, Mahinda, who used to be the president, and he got this port built in his constituency and it's a very small constituency and a very small port never really prospered but the china chinese are taking it over uh, taking all the debt so they built it and now they're going to run it and the same thing has happened in colombo south harbor the americans complain about the chinese saying they're creating debt amongst uh, companies around the world. But the problem is, is the local politicians just love the infrastructure and they love to have it. That's why we, when the Belt and Road started, there were 64 countries signed up to the Belt and Road. Now there's 146, if you include China. That's three quarters of the 195 United Nations countries. So there is a demand, and the demand doesn't necessarily from the push from China. There's also a pull from local politicians. There is one other um, big operator besides China merchants, and that is a Costco company, China Ocean Shipping Company. And that's been developing the port of Piraeus, which is here. And I gather the wolf is in Piraeus. I'm not very happy with the Chinese running the port, but that's just incidental. But the two big operators. So China, what you've got to realize is China can build and operate ships and ports. And China's impetus on this 
link between the Indian Ocean and Europe has been focused on Africa. Because if you build a port, it gives you an, an, a railway, it gives you an entry. Now, I don't want to go through all these projects, but I want to emphasize what China is trying to do here. You've got a link, they want, to, sorry. They've got a link between Cape Town and Cairo. And they want to they build a railway from Djibouti to Addis Ababa. And they want to link it to Lagos. They've also built a railway from Mombasa to Nairobi. And they want to link it to Douala. So those three routes alone, I, I'm going to call transcontinental. So China is trying to change, if you like, the geography of Africa. And the other key development is here in the Suez Canal Economic Zone. This is being built by um, Tianjin, which is a, a separate urban entity in China that's involved in the Suez Canal Zone this economic development. So both Russia and China are expanding or see Africa as a place for expansion. Not only for minerals, but also for land to grow crops, which they need. Now, this brings us closer to home, to the China Oceania South Pacific Passage. I don't normally do photographs because I believe a map is worth 10,000 words and a photograph is only worth 1,000. <laughs> um, but I've used um, Admiral Lu Huaqing, who was head of the, PA, the PLA Navy. And what he did was triggered the shift from China's coastal defense to a modern offshore defense strategy. The coastal defense was against the Soviet Union. The modern defense strategy is to break through what it sees as the island chains uh, of the United States to access the area beyond. And much of the emphasis now is on this first island chain. Because China, what it argues, it wants to be recognition, it wants understanding, and the fact that when America made a lot of its acquisitions in the Pacific, China in the 1840s onwards was impotent under the Qing dynasty, it felt it didn't have this opportunity. Now, as it's become a superpower, it wants to have, have this opportunity of acquiring islands in the same way the United States do. And one of the initial targets is the South China Sea. It wants to abrogate this area was originally established by Taiwan. I should, if I was looking at the China, I should have painted this red as well, because this is what China is wanting. Already it's reclaimed land and militarized islands in the Scarborough Reef and the second Thomas Shoal within this area, which is part of the Philippines exclusive economic zone. And while well, this upsets <laughs> some of the literal countries, Malaysia, Brunei, <laughs> Vietnam in particular, Malaysia and Indonesia, um, they still want to access China's infrastructure, even though 
it's um, threatening some of their sovereign rights. Of course, we have Australia, India, Japan, and the United States don't like the transit through this area being interrupted. So what China is pushing in the In the South China Sea, it's now extended into the China Pacific. And much of the recent discussion about this area has already been taking place. Why does China want to come into this area? Well, it claims it wants to do South South testing. What China wants to do for the 146 countries which are part of the Belt and Road is to get them to be a to be a testing ground for south south relations but the big thrust here is to eliminate taiwan from these islands and also just as japan did maybe 10 15 years ago it wants to use the cultural sphere here it wants to give training to pacific islanders he wants to give scholarships to Pacific Islanders to take advantage. So what this map shows is the exclusive economic areas, which have fisheries, tourism, infrastructure, and selected projects. I haven't listed all the projects China has in this area, but um, this has been brought up recently in the Solomon Islands, the Tulagi port development. Um, it offers 23 meters of deep water. In 2019, um, when Solomon Island switched from Taiwan to People's Republic of China, when that occurred, uh, there's a company called the China Sam Company, which took a lease on the Tulagi Island. And this is where one would want to build um, uh, enlarge the Tulagi port. That's not the only thing China's been concerned about in terms of ports. There was also one in the Spiritu Santo. There's a, a port called Luganville, which um, China wanted to develop. And while that's been development, we should note that um, the United States and um, uh, United States have got the uh, Manus Island Bay. So this is very fluid at the moment. But this is not China's main game. I think China's main game is Eurasia. But this does offer an interesting sphere for China to operate. And China has got dreams of being a great polar power. This is uh, an academic um, Anne-Marie Brady. That's the term she's used. But They've already got five bases in Antarctica. And you can see the green and gold have only got three now, all on the coast. But the key area, the key area is this central area because China wants to develop its own global positioning system. And that's very much located in that area. I think the Australian government has just given the bases some, uh, in some capital to develop <coughs> helicopters and things to have a much broader survey of this area. So money is being devoted to the Antarctic Division to cover this area better. But you can see what's happening here. because the Chinese really think this is the best area for looking at space. Now, the third 
Ocean Passage is China and the Arctic Ocean. China wants to be a near Arctic space, near Arctic state. And they're calling it the ice silk road. Everything's being called something silk road now. So this is the ice silk road. And the, this company I mentioned before, Costco, the ship, ship owner, has now been trialing this northern sea route it, um, during the period between uh, May and September. Uh, they'll be sending the specialized ships across this route. China is quite keen on this area because once when the Russians took Crimea, they pulled out of this LNG plant here at Sabata. And they, all the companies, American companies pulled out and China moved in. And that's sending back um, oil and grazement sent, or back oil and gas back to China. The other thing about this is with the melt, it's now possible to use some of these rivers to use these ports like Novi port and bring back, bring down your goods through to Kazakhstan with the melt. One of my Korean students has been responsible for this project. The other last thing I want to mention this here is that a company, look for this company called Licycle. They tried to develop, a Chinese tried to develop a course, um, a port in northern Sweden called Licycle. It's only a village until the Swedish government caught on what was happening and they were developing this. Of course, the problem with um, the Swedish and the Finns and Norwegians, they're more concerned about the Russians than the Chinese. But anyway, the Sweden did move on this. And, but that company comes up again when we get to South America. It's um, owned by a gentleman called Wang Jin. <clears throat> The other part of the China's push to the Arctic is, has been focused on Greenland. It's got several projects in Greenland. Uh, here, the zinc, molybdenum here is the alloy for making steel. Isua, there was an um, iron ore operation which has since ceased. And this other unpronounceable place here is for rubies. But the key thing here is Kianfeld and Kringlian. Why? Because this is rare earth. And China is trying to gain, take a uh, monopoly of rare earth around the world. So, but the interesting thing in both these developments is the involvement of Australian companies. The other thing that the Chinese were speculating was a new airport for Nook and also a, a road coming up here to link some road construction to link some of these settlements. Uh, this was favored by a pro-independence group, but again, the uh, foreign policy in Greenland is, is operated by the Danish government and that wasn't allowed, but it did prompt President Trump to offer to buy Greenland. <laughs> and our last passage is South America. And this initially was unattractive to China because they thought it's American domain. But there are certain things they could get, particularly oil, bauxite, iron ore, and things like uh, soybeans, meat. So a lot of projects were, were proposed. I can't go through them all because there's 107, but um, 
I've just mentioned Pananakawa, which is the port, which the Chinese harbour engineering are quite good at building ports. So that's done. There was a high speed railway in Venezuela, which didn't succeed. There was also one in Mexico, but unfortunately, the, the president's wife was involved in the in the group which were proposing it, and it caused such a thing that they abandoned and abandoned it. The Chinese are still trying to secure some benefits from having done the engineering work. Um, the Nicaragua Canal was also being mooted as a bigger and better than the Panama Canal. Again, I mentioned Wang Ling in Lysical. His company was involved in this Nicaragua adventure. That hasn't come across. And the final thing, you remember in Africa, we had transcontinental railways. The same is occurring in South America. Originally, um, the, Chi the Chinese wanted to build one across here to Peru, but then Bolivia wanted to join in with, with um, Brazil, and, and then Bolsonaro had another route, and nothing's happened. So what's happened in, um, with China's investments in South um, Latin America and the Caribbean is that um, some have been very risky, particularly in Venezuela. So they're pulling back because I think it's much better to develop in South and Southeast Asia. And also the Americans now want to build back a better world and they're going to trial that in South America. I think this came from the G7. So they want to trial this, but as far as I can see, they haven't reported yet. Okay, let's go into my conclusion. So I've developed three models because I think these underpin the belt and the road. There's, I mentioned that the transcontinental model across Eurasia. This is, I would call this Main Street. I'm afraid that East Coast South America, Africa, Oceania, and West Coast South America are very much cul-de-sacs in the world. So you've got Main Street and cul-de-sacs. And if you live in a cul-de-sac, you have to have a very good government to make the best of your position. So that's, and I see these Chinese trying to link up across Africa, across West Coast South America. So they can be like um, North America and Eurasia. There's a second one is the reverse model. You've seen dry ports like Kashgar and Kunming developing a port in the western part of China being linked to ports on the Maritime Sea Road. So Kashgar to Gwadar, Kunming to Kuyakapu. And then the third model is the Djibouti model way to Addis Ababa. Abba, Abba in Ethiopia, and which to me I call classic because I think they're classic colonial penetration of countries. Um, so maybe I, I would call that the reverse colonial and perhaps uh, the classic colonial way of penetration. And these models cover all the 38 projects identified by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I've covered 34 of them with three land bridges, four economic corridors, and four blue economic passengers. One doesn't fit. So we got a 35th, which doesn't fit. Those are all the distribution of them. Notice. 
This was 2019 and they hadn't put many down in South America, but I put them down tonight for you. But this one doesn't fit really. It's the transoceanic fiber optic cable. Now, who do you think is developing that? The company called Huawei. <laughs> See, what China, what worries America is the loss of its hegemony, of course, but it's also worried about China getting control of data, architecture, norms, and standards. And you can see that Huawei has already linked what I call an intercontinental model. And it's also now doing this Pakistan, East Africa cable express. This one linking the, the Indian Ocean to Europe. This is why India is concerned. I also found out in researching this um, paper that there's also one called Kamal. You may remember the Australian government put money to provide uh, a digital connection for the Solomon Islands and the Coral Sea. And I found out there's a, a publication called Banking on Belt and Road, which has been put out by Americans. But they claim that some of the money built by, paid for, for the Coral Sea connection is now being used in the Kummel connection to pay off the Chinese developers, but that may be worth looking at. But the idea behind China is to reshuffle. It wants to reshuffle the global uh, hierarchy. It wants to get this recognition of its position in the world. And this dovetails with its priorities within China. What China's doing now at the moment is developing smart city clusters. Um, two of the big ones are the Yangtze, lower Yangtze area, and Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay area. And these are going to face off against the Americans in uh, Silicon Valley and also in Cascadia focused on Seattle. One thing I haven't mentioned is COVID-19, and I'll finish off with that. About 60% of the projects in China and overseas have been affected by it. Now, what does this mean? In the next 10 years or so, will some of the countries, the 146 countries in the Belt and Road, still want airports, still want ports, still want highways and railways? This is affecting China's ambitions. I think China says the Belt and Road is still intact, but it may be shifting to, towards a digital Silk Road, another Silk Road. There are other Silk Roads too, which I haven't mentioned, but these will be in tandem with this. There's a green Silk Road because by 2060, China is going to have a clean country and also there's an educational Silk Road. Um, so all that brings me to the end. Um, I want to make, bring you back to um, to what I started out at the beginning to say something about geography, because what I've tried to do is to use maps and a geography approach. And I would hope that geography lends itself to hybrid concepts such as logistical geographies and geologistics to explain China beyond its boundaries more so than an economics 
for anthropology. So I hope that this oration has underlined that this is not a weakness of geography, but an undoubted strength. And then I'll end. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. A fascinating and deeply complex topic to unpack, but certainly I think you've done a fantastic job for us tonight with that. I believe we do have some time now for questions uh, for those online as well as here in the audience with us live tonight. So if you would like to ask one, please raise a hand and we'll get going. Peter, I found that one of the most educational talks I've ever been to in my life. So thank you for that. I'd like to, to kind of be able to pursue this. So you've got this from a lot of sources. Is there any particular source that would be worthwhile? Well, I, I would start with the one banking on the Belton Road. Um, I haven't used that source because it started in 2000 and went to 2018. Um, I can give you the reference to it afterwards. But they looked at 19,000 projects between 2000 and 2018. This was a the, Bel the Belt and Road investment by the Chinese. But that's where I got the nugget about the Kamalt project. It's well done, but it, the Americans tend to be a little bit biased towards China. And we've got to sort of balance it up some way. Um, they're fearful. And, and you get a whole range of things that uh, America's going to lose its number one position in the world. Uh, there was a publication by PwC, which showed that number one is going to be in two, 2050. Number one was going to be China. Number two, India. Number three, the United States. Number four, Indonesia. And one of the things of mentioning Tanjung Priya was to say that Indonesia is important and we should recognize that more. But um, uh, you have to fish around for information. There's lots of single studies done, but nothing is comprehensive. So if you want to look at the extent, the impact and the significance of this investment, you really got to look around, but start. I can give you the reference to that. To start with banking on the Belt and Road, that's easily available. It's done by William and Mary University in America, but that's a good start. Okay. Really, that's a question on sources to find out more. Our uh, next question. Uh, you mentioned right at the end uh, a green silk road. As you've spoken uh, about uh, uh, port. Um, um, park city developments and uh, land transport developments, I have been thinking now, a lot of this is not going to be terribly friendly to the environment. Good, good question. How uh, cognizant is China of the need uh, to, if you like, um, maintain uh, any appreciation from the rest of the world? to do things the right way in terms of the environment at the moment? Well, it's debatable what China does, but, but all these projects involve displacement. Um, let's look at the Lao Railway between um, going to Vientiane from Kunming. That displaced 4,000 people. Um, there's a lot of opposition to China in Myanmar because some of the the, the project, the, the the oil and the gas pipelines, and some of the dams they want to build are also dis displacement. But but I think China is using this uh, the Green Silk Road as a means of <laughs> Um, 
showing its credentials in the same way as it's using the health silk road to, to distribute its vaccines to developing countries. I, I think these are terms they use upon the, there's a, there's a central commission in China called the National Reform and Development Commission, which pinpoints all these ones. So there are many, many ones, but doing infrastructure does affect the environment. There's no doubt about that. And all of these cases, I think that may be one of the reasons they didn't proceed with China's railway in the, between Brazil and Peru, because it was going to affect the, the Amazonian environment. And in fact, some of those roads which are, uh, are in dotted lines in China go through the Amazon because they want to tap the resources of the Amazon. But any, any infrastructure development does have uh, adverse impacts as well. So it's important you raise that issue. I think I've given you three examples. Thanks, I'll have a question at the back. I'm just wondering if the, the port that they're developing in Myanmar, um, is that in the middle of the Rhine? Is it people there? Really? Yes. Okay, so that might be, there'd be a subtext there. Um, well, I, th I think they are trying to develop Rakhine State. This is what the Myanmar government are trying to do. So, um, the, there have been rough patches before for China when they've been trying to develop dams, um, but there's certain military control being exercised of Rakhine State now. So I don't think it's had an inverse, inverse impact on the, the oil or the gas pipeline. Um, so I think the fact that they've now changed the name to the China Myanmar Economic Corridor is that obviously there's a link up now, a stronger link up between Myanmar and China than there used to be. Uh, the, the problem for China all the time is India. Mr. Modi and um, 2015 was went to China, was fated by the Chinese. They wanted him to cooperate on the Belt and Road, and that didn't happen. He wouldn't join. But um, so India is the other one is, is concerned about this. And India, what it's trying to do in the Indo-Pacific is to try and develop highways, so have a highway system for the not railways, it can't compete on railways yet. And the other casualty from this is Japan, because Japan has had fast trains in between Bandung and Jakarta, and they're pushed out of that. Uh, they haven't developed the one between Bangkok and Chiang Mai. So there is a lot of um, competition, and China seems to be winning all the ones where, which you need to win. So are all the railway gauges the same? Uh, what I did on my, I have to confess, what I did on the Indochina map, I cut off all the conventional one meter railways. And the reason for that was because China wants to do the standard gauge uh, railways. So the fast trains in China are standard gauge. And, um, and what it really wants to do is supplant all the one meter gauges in, in the China Peninsula with the standard gauge. And the Russian broader. Yeah, it's ones in, in, I gave you the ones in millimeters, but in old time term, four foot eight and a half. And the Russian was five foot three, which is the Irish gauge, I think. And Victoria. And Victoria, oh yes, sorry, I've forgotten your local knowledge. The intermodal 
exchange between China and uh, Mongolia at the border with train is uh, not streamlined, let's put it that way. No, but they're working on it. And uh, again, there's a bit of competition in Mongolia between the Japanese and the Chinese. Uh, I skipped Mongolia because it really was part of the, the Northern Land Bridge, but I've looked at it and uh, they're trying to develop another alternative route in, in Mongolia, which involves a place called Ovut, which has got um, Australian involved in coal mining there. Yeah, yeah. so Mongolia is interesting. Um, because previously it was very much tied to the to Russia. Now it's it, it wants to be. It has to. The Chinese want to press through it, but it um, it tries to resist as much as it can. Because the Chinese in the outer periphery now have been pushing the the Han language, the Mandarin language, um, in Inner Mongolia. Um, Kunming and also Yunnan. Um, so if you want to study physics and chemistry, you study that in Mandarin. But if you want to study history and geography, you can do it in Uyghur. I know that because I've, we've just been hosting a Chinese linguistics student at ANU. Uh, next one. Down the back. Yeah, have you identified in your wanderings an intellectual property sort of road at all? No. Uh, <laughs> and how that might affect the world, but as near as I can tell, a lot of countries around the world are now withdrawing intellectual property internally in their countries, and that, and that may affect other countries, may affect China in the next. 20, 50 years, for example, in the future, it may, but I'm not sure. I'm just wondering whether you had seen any, the effects of that, for example, in, whereas China accumulated a lot of intellectual property over the previous years, but that may not be available for them in the future. Well, that's a good point because um, we do have an intellectual property expert here, so I'm a little bit reluctant <laughs> to enter this sphere, but, um, China, um, for, for many American countries after 2000, once it joined the, the World Trade Council, they got into China. Um, and if you wanted to do business in China, you had to give up a certain amount of your intellectual property. Now reshoring is taking place in some degrees because um, Many countries want to um, bring back, because of the supply chain problem, they want to bring back some of their industries which went across to China. But, but many of the big multinational corporations did join in with China. In fact, I should have mentioned that in, in my diagram, when I had you, um, Xi'an has got a Volvo manufacturing plant, and Urumqi um, has also got a Volkswagen plant. So there is a lot of already intellectual property already in China in that particular area. But I think the next big area of interest is going to be data. That's where I came at the end. I think that's the battlefield in the future. Is on controlling data, and uh, if you're interested, I got, I've got a lot of papers I've been reading on from the Asia National Asia Research Centre are all on trying to China's trying to control data, because if you think of it now, China is linked in with Russia, um, Iran, Middle East. Areas which the United States now doesn't have a great fix on. So there may be two sets of intellectual properties. But do you want to enlarge on this, Matthew? Thank you. 
Do we have any more questions from our audience? Peter, I have one question and it's about the fiber to the node problem within China on the 19 um, cluster cities, soon to be renamed greater metropolitan regions. Right. What are the fundamental issues that you see in the connection of the production systems into the node? Because the built and road is about node to node connectivity yeah. primarily. But this is another development in China, which you can export. That's where I think they're developing that. I, the last time I was in China was in 19, 2019. Uh, and I was at a conference in making Zhejiang a city cluster. What can Zhejiang do? Uh, independently of Shanghai, I didn't think much. But they want to develop that as a cluster. So I think it's a little bit different. It's how you organize those clusters. And the ones which are going to be critical is the Yangtze Delta and the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau one. Um, most of my work has not been on telecommunications in China. I do have a map in my book on it, if you want to look at that which shows how developments within China are linked to countries outside China. So I've been focusing on the data connections outside China. Within China, I've been focusing the fast trains. So all those clusters are going to be linked by fast trains. What happens to the places which are not on the fast train route is a good question you need to ask. But I, I do have connections with the first train movement in China. Okay, we might leave there. If there are any more questions, uh, we will, of course, have supper and there will be more opportunities to speak with Peter. Uh, without further ado, we'll go for a vote of thanks now uh, and we'll finish up for the evening. Well, thanks, Peter, for such a splendid uh, oration. And I would, one thing I'd like him to have talked about is the um, problem uh, with the Chinese investment in other countries that is just all done by Chinese workers yes. and Chinese capital and with very little benefit to the local community apart from the physical infrastructure. And I think there's some negative responses in many countries now to the way that Chinese investment goes on. But I want to talk about something else, uh, uh, something about careers, because <clears throat> when we talk about geologistics, um, Peter has been right at the forefront of that. And it's interesting that when Monash University started, I think it was 1968, with Basil Johnson, uh, he was highly successful in recruiting really quality staff, including Peter. And uh, they became, in short time, one of the forefront research universities in geography in Australia. And that was a big boost. And it's not surprising that the ANU headhunted Peter <laughs> to, to be involved with their Asia Pacific studies and where he's really been one of the most significant contributors. And I do think that that's um, something that we in Australia should really uh, appreciate because uh, we need these linkages to Asia and uh, to be properly informed as to what's going on in Asia. Uh, in really substantial research, I think, is of vital importance to this country. And as a result of that, whenever I'm going to Adelaide, <laughs> by one of the many alternative routes between Brisbane and Adelaide, I always try to go to Canberra for a couple of reasons. There are two Peters in Canberra that I really like to meet up with. One of them is Peter Lort one of my former students from New England, who became a senior principal research officer with CSIRO. Uh, thanks to the research direction I put him on when I supervised his postgraduate work at New England. And Peter Lord and Peter Rimmer, um, pretty good mates, right? <laughs> Together with Basil Johnson, who started the New England, the uh, Monash department. And so whenever we go to Ad through, Ad uh, through Canberra and stay with Peter Lord, I always hope to meet up with Peter, the other Peter, Rimmer. 
Unfortunately, Minister of Android Times up there, he's overseas. <laughs> so only occasionally did it happen. So it's been to me uh, a very special occasion to catch up with Peter and to catch up with the research he's been doing. And I think that uh, it's very vital work that he's still doing and good luck to him with that. And I think that we all should appreciate what he has done. So I'm only too pleased to move this particular vote of thanks. Thank you, Peter. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Peter, for coming out uh, today to give us this talk. And we very much appreciate all the information you've imparted to us. Everyone, that will be the conclusion of our Thompson oration for 2022. A uh, real quick plug, if you're not already a member of the RGSQ, please look on our website. It's as little as $5 per month paid annually, which makes it a fantastic opportunity for you to get both this fantastic lecture series, but also all of our various other documents, publications, and access to other opportunities as well. So please do consider becoming a member if you're not one already. I'd also like to plug that in another few weeks' time, we do have the first in a new series of sessions, our Geography and Conversation, uh, which will be hosted here at Gregory Place. So please make sure you log into the website and put your name down for that one. Places are filling quickly, I have been told. And it's set to be a very fascinating discussion about flooding and floodplains and where we should be building necessarily. So very topical, given that some of our recent experiences here in South East Queensland. With that, everyone, thank you. Have a fantastic night. For those online, we wish you well. For those here, we, of course, have some supper and drinks behind you. Thank you, everyone.